you had over 900 moais on the island. Some are still buried, many of them were visible. They're buried by natural earth that has moved over the years, sediment that has shifted. So you see them up and halfway, and some just the top of the heads visible. Now, the Moais are done in different periods. You have the early period, that's 700 to 850. Now, the smaller ones are from this period. They first started out like you would find in Hawaii and also in the area of the French Polynesia, like tiki, small little carvings. Then, during the middle period, and that's 850 to about 1648, that was the period where they started getting larger. There's approximately 272 existing ahus. They're basically the temples that most of the Moais sit upon. Now the ahus, they changed also. At the beginning, they were small. Many of the ahus you witnessed, you saw at three or four levels. These were built upon throughout the middle and into the late period. The late period is post 1640s. Now, many of the Moais are considered to be representative of people's relatives. When they did the statues, you notice they're all turned inwards, all except for a kiwi. Now, a kiwi is seven that do face the water. Now, the reason that they have these facing inward is, as I mentioned, it's your ancestors. You're keeping their power, their mana, it's called. And what happens is, if you faced them to the sea, the mana would go out to sea. The power would leave the island. You want to keep that power within your family. So you have your relatives facing you, facing towards your homestead. Now the seven that face out the sea at Akivi, they think those might have been the seven navigators, the first ones to come from the society islands into the island of Easter Island. And during the spring equinox, the sun sets right in that line. The autumn equinox, the sun rises right on that line. They are put in somewhat like Stonehenge would be, put in that straight line for the equinoxes. My mother is an archaeologist and an anthropologist. She worked with Thor Heyer, though. She worked with William Mulloy. She worked with all the scientists that have come and worked on the island. And today she keeps working with, uh, with Heyer, uh, grandsons. Scientists, they have studied the statue so much that they got kind of stuck, you know? They cannot study further the statues until technology improves so we can find more of the statues without breaking them. Uh, so what most of the scientists, all, most of the scientists that have come already to the island, they are more interesting today, not so much on the statues, on the daily day stuff that people had to live. And uh, Thor Heyerdahl, grandson, with uh, my mother, that's what they're doing, and working at Poike and discovering new settlements. And So the island around and the place is, it, it's, I don't know, it's like archaeological Disney World. In the late period on Easter Island, the Rapa Nui, they were over 12,000 on this small island. What happens, there was lack of water, lack of food, construction material they started to have rivalries, almost a civil war. It was the long ears and the short ears. And these started very big battles. The things that happened in the battles, you might have witnessed many of the Moais lying down. 
These were actually knocked over. The reason they were knocked over, you wanted to take away a person's power, you took away their mana, their power, by toppling their family statues. Their family power is dissipated. So you'll see a lot of the Moais, they're lying down due to these battles. Many scientists and many different people are studying this period, the late period, on Easter Island today. Reason being, it's duplicated possibly in other areas. Lack of water, lack of food, and how people will possibly turn on each other due to this. Statues were carved with tools in the first stages with, with tools of pure basalt. The stone of the statues is volcanic ashes, uh, tough, I think it's called in English, tova in Spanish. And, and that's the last real details of the statues, like the fingernails on their bellies or maybe the, the, their ears or part of their eyes, maybe they were carved with other tools, could it be obsidian or smaller tools to do small details. But the first staging for any carving was pure basalt, which is the center of the lava basalt stone with no bubbles, the, the most dense stones that we have. And most of them have different type of features. There's only one group that have the same features. Now you have features that are representation of the person who did pass away. Now you also have some of the ahus that actually contained bones, and later in the middle period, they also did cremations and they were buried in the ahu. Now these are from the craters of the volcanoes. They're volcanic ash that over a period of time is condensed and turned into a stone. They carve these. Now you did see what's called the top knot. That looks like a hat, but actually that represents the hair, basically tied into almost a bun in the back of the head. Now that comes from a different quarry and that's a red stone, but it also is a volcanic stone. You also have from some of the different quarries, not radical, you have some that have more of a white color from a different type of volcanic stone. The stone of the statues, you can hit them and you're going to break your hand. It's a rock. <laughs> but, but if you just touch it and do it like that, you're going to see that it breaks. It's very fragile stone, so that's why they decided to carve on that stone. How they moved them, still a mystery. How they erected them, still a mystery. It's amazing how these stones to be put up, how they did it so simple and rudimentary tools at that time. We had them take a crane to raise one of the largest ones up. It broke the crane. The crane could not actually put it up. They had to bring in the second crane to do it. I always give the example to people that when a mother see her kid under a car, she will pull the car out, take the kid out, and she's gonna do the job that in the moment she needed to do. That energy, we all have it. That power, we all have it. The thing is that we don't know it. Today, many people call that power faith. And when you get the, the power of that faith and someone pushing you around from the back, you could accomplish anything. From the period of 1000 to 1680, hundreds of people were working on these. Mankind is always trying to get it bigger and taller and make it nicer and, and that's our flaw. <laughs> now those of you fortunate enough to go up to Orongo, you witnessed the Birdman Society. Now the Birdman was in the late period. This is after the Moais were created. You did have the strongest, the most powerful to become the leader. How this was transpired, you had to go from the top of Arango. You had to climb down, get in the water, swim out, two islands stood offshore, and they had sooty turns in these islands. They had to swim out, climb up, get a sooty turn egg, return with the egg unbroken, climbing back down, swimming in the water, and climbing back up. The first one to do this would be the Birdman, the leader. The bird band continued for a while until Peru came over and they took slaves from the island. 
Now, of course, taking slaves, you want the strongest, the biggest. So they took most of the large people, the population of power, and they moved those as slaves. And the Birdman, unfortunately, it stopped. But that's not the only volcanic aspect of Easter Island. There's five volcanic peaks, but actually the island itself was created from volcanic activity. If you were to take a really good look, it's one large volcano. It rises from the sea floor 3,048 meters, over 10,000 feet from the floor to the top of the peak. Now the Rapa Nui. Some originally thought they did come from the Polynesian islands. Others thought they came from South America. Up by Orongo, they did find remnants of corn, sweet potato, and these are staples of South America. They found buildings that resembled very much of the people of the Andes, we call the Incas. They discovered though these buildings now are older than the Incas. Also, they did do carbon dating on the skeletons. They found out these are Polynesian descents. Doesn't mean they possibly didn't trade with South America. Their origins just were not. Now, Herodal, Tor Herodal, when he took the Contiki, when he sailed over, he was trying to possibly explain that they came from South America. Recently, though, this has been dispelled. They do know the people of the early period arrived from the Polynesian islands. Polynesians leap thanks to the ocean, not thanks, thanks to the land. Polynesians, they were experts on the ocean and they travel with their farms on their boats. So that's what makes them even more experts because they had more time on the ocean to learn the currents, to know where they go, to learn the currents of the wind, to learn about the stars. The island is in basically the middle of nowhere. You have nothing to break any of the waves, any of the movement of the ocean. Winds can pick up a swell, and the swell can come from a storm that's a thousand miles away. We're pretty isolated. If the plane don't come, milk runs out first, then flour, and then everything else, and we end up nothing else until the plane comes again. Food by plane and, and, and cars and construction materials by, boat, by ship. So I, I believe that the island provides everything in a very comfortable way or lazy way for everybody. And something that the island brings us is that it has all the basic needs covered. It's never cold. We all have a piece of land, so you got your house. So you could be protected from the cold that we don't have, or from the rain. Uh, food is right there on the ocean, it's free, it's waiting for you. You just need to go over, over there and pick it up. If you get too much, you give them away and, or, and trade them for something else. Or if you get too much, sell them. Um, and because you got land, you got a place to die. So the three basic needs that any man on any planet or in any country could have need, you got them covered here, so it's pretty comfortable in that. If you go around the island, you're gonna see fancy houses and, and houses that you could say they're, they're poor, but there is no difference on the social status. We know who is richer than who, but there's no difference. We all eat in the same restaurants, we all go fishing on the same places, we all go to the same bank, and we all went to the same school, so I believe there is a much friendlier place than living in a big city like Santiago in Chile, for example. Uh, you go there, no one says hello, everybody's cranky. You say hello to someone and they might bite you. And, and, and the world don't supposed to be that, that way. <laughs>